Welcome to the Designated Drinker Show, the podcast that's raising the bar on craft cocktails. I am your host, Louise Salas, and with me is my very, very talented friend who can navigate just about any situation, the mixtress DC, Gina. <laughs> Man, that statement is loaded. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you know, who better to be in a I, sticky situation than with you? Are you gonna get us out of it? Yeah, I you know, I'll pretend. And then be like, and then in the end be like, I can't believe they believe me. That's what it is. You fake it till you make it, right? Uh, right? I feel like that's real. <laughs> I feel like that's the realest statement anyone said in like, you know, the last three years. <laughs> All right. Another real thing is that it is women's his- women's month. Women's month. It's women's month. I love it. Strong women only apply. Yes, yes. 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 Um, I want to open the show with a, a trailblazer, if you will. Amelia Earhart. Mm. Yes. True trailblazer broke all kinds of rules. Um, she was the first American female aviator to fly solo over the Atlantic and the first person who ever flew solo from Hawaii back to the U.S. or to the mainland. Uh, the U.S. mainland, I should say. She was born in 1897 in the heartland, just like me. Not born in 1897, though. Um, she was born in Kansas, and at a really young, young age, um, she refused immediately not to be boxed in by her gender. Um, again, it's 1897, Kansas, and she played basketball. She took auto repair courses, and she briefly attended college, which doesn't sound like, oh, how how badass was that? But the truth was, it's 1897 yeah. that she did these things. Um and then uh, in 1920, she began flying lessons and very quickly passed her, her flight test in December of 1921. Um, and when she did that, ha ha ha, sky's the limit. Uh, you know I was gonna do that, right? Until- Oh, I, I got it. <laughs> sky's the limit. Um, um, uh, until uh, July 1937, when unfortunately, which I think most of us know the story, she disappeared somewhere over the Pacific Ocean, and the plane unfortunately was never found. Um, and it is still considered one of the greatest unsolved mysteries of the 20th century. I like to think that she landed somewhere on a beach somewhere, met some beautiful native people, and said, fuck it, I'm staying here. Yeah, she was married though. Exactly why she stayed on this yeah, island with yeah. these beautiful <laughs> natives and said, no, I want to stay here. <laughs> yeah, I feel like she had a good marriage. Didn't she like love her husband? Like they had a great, like, a great yeah, marriage. Yeah, I've not, I've not heard, I, what, my research didn't bring up anything I think I watched negative. the movie. You saw the movie? Yeah, I definitely you saw the, may the, have had an edible. Maybe you saw so the I Hallmark. I got really involved with it. The Hallmark version of <laughs> Millie Earhart. <laughs> 100%. I'm not going to lie. I, uh, you know, I, if it was on Hallmark Channel, I definitely would have watched it then. I would have been like, and my mom, I would have watched it with my mom if that was the case. There you go. Because that was my mom's favorite channel. Was it? 100%. That's fun. That's yeah. Fun. It always had a clever ending. It had the same plot twist. Everything was Oh, you, you always, you knew it was going to happen. I mean, yeah. you know it's going to happen. It's just going to be the same thing with, you know, yeah. a slightly different yeah. like, twist. Although she... Well, she does die, so I don't yeah. Well, or does she? That's what I'm saying. Maybe or she disappears. didn't. Maybe she didn't. So let's get this show back on the on the rail, shall we? And uh, introduce today's designated drinker. Okay. We are speaking of extraordinary women with remarkable stories that should be shared. So it brings me to today's designated drinker, who is also a badass trailblazer, mm-hmm. the founder of Fatback Media, Mary DeVito. Welcome back, Mary. Hello. Hi. It's so good to see you guys after a few years. Oh, it's, it's so, so nice. wonderful to see like, your face. Yes. I'm not like I've screen. been in the in a abyss for like two years. I know. Or <laughs> or a cave or something. Then I'm crawling back out and like the lights <laughs> hurting my eyes. <laughs> <laughs> good news is your eyes are not gray, just so you know. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty funny. Well, so, thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for coming back. And so uh, tell us, what have you been up to? Gosh, I feel like um, kind of like what Gina said uh, off off camera, like just trying to survive the last two years. Yeah. But um, knock on wood, I've been steadily working. Um, you know, my marketing firm, Fatback Media, which specializes in hospitality, um, at the beginning of the ba- pandemic when restaurants and bars were struggling, I was really concerned that I was going to lose clients. But uh, luckily, I have not. And I've been working steadily and probably working even harder to try to market for my clients yeah. um, even harder because as you know, as Gina, Gina knows and a lot of restaurant and bar owners know, we all had to pivot 
yeah. what, what you know our products during the pandemic and get really really creative, especially during the start of the pandemic when we had a lockdown. Yeah, suddenly everyone was doing virtual cooking classes and virtual cocktail classes, <laughs> trying to connect with our audience. Yep. So, but I, I'm very fortunate. I've been working steadily. That's great. That's great. That's wonderful to hear. I think, first of all, I feel like pivoting is like the craziest term ever. I feel like after these next few years, we'll never use that term yeah, again. Yeah, we'll, we'll, <laughs> we'll have to, we'll put it away in the COVID vault. <laughs> and maybe Geraldo Rivera will find it like 50 years from now. <laughs> I think it's a very corporate term. I prefer hustling. That's what people in the F&B industry do. They hustle. Great yeah. hustle. hundred <laughs> percent. I just put something on my Instagram, my personal Instagram, and I was like, you want to know what it takes to do B&B every day? This is a straight hustle. And like, I just put up a video of like what my morning was like. We made knishes. We Then I went back to the farm. I did something with the chickens. I did a quick video. I had my kids. And like, that all happened in less than eight hours. And everyone's like, that's one day. I'm like, that is one day. You have chickens now? Yes, yeah, so I'm on a farm. <laughs> Hold on, I'll, I'll get to that. So we, but what I, wanted to, I want to talk to you about this because this is really important. So P, doing PR for restaurants or doing anything in this, in this space, you know, and our industry is changing so much, you know, um, it's kind of like, what do you, you know, how do you create now? Like, do you find that now your clients are asking for something different, right? Because because of being people being home, I feel like all of our businesses shifted to, you know, being in front of a camera. All of a sudden, you went from being behind the line and having people come in the restaurant and them taking their pictures and stuff. That now people that necessarily didn't want to be in front of the camera or creating content had. So tell I want. Can you like elaborate a little bit because. Yeah. It's really crucial, like, what's happening in the next rendition yeah. of restaurants. So, Gina, you and I have known each other for over 10 years at the very start of what social media and blogging were. And being one of the early, earlier bloggers, um, you know, I started doing that even before Instagram was a thing. Yeah. And the time between what Instagram looked like back then in 2009 to now, that's what, 13 years? Are we in 2022 now? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't even know what year we're in. <laughs> <laughs> things have looked really different. First, it was okay to have an aesthetic feed with filtered photos, which was a terrible idea for food in the first place. Yeah, like, why God. would you even put a purple filter on, like, a steak? That's horrifying. Yeah. Yep. But now, there's such an oversaturation, and every business is trying to, like, one-up one another to kind of rise above all the noise and yep. get consumers' attention. So that, what that means is a static photo isn't good enough anymore. Now, now everybody has to be a videographer and everybody has to be a celebrity chef and be in front of the camera, which isn't comfortable for a lot of people, right? Yeah. People are perfectly yep. happy being back in the kitchen <laughs> doing their thing. They did not expect to have to be a, a Gordon Ramsay yeah. all of a sudden. Yeah. I feel like I'll use car salesman sometimes. I'm like, oh my God, we have this bagel over here. It's really great. And, and you can have this drink right over here. And this is what you're doing over here. And you're like, what has happened? Right, right. Just eat the fucking food. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> can I just say that? I'm going to say that my next reel. The food's fucking good. So just, I don't, what am I say? Yeah, and you went through this wave of um, Instagram looking perfectly curated, right? Yes. And everything had to look perfect. And we, we reached a point where everybody was so tired of that over-perfection and these like unattainable standards of beauty, where you, whether you're talking about physical beauty or like the food on your plate. Yeah. So now everybody wants authenticity, like, like spontaneous, authentic, organic looking content, which is kind of a relief because you don't yeah. have to like overly produce everything now, right? So now it's like with the rise of TikTok, for example, yeah. you can just be in the kitchen doing whatever, and people people want to see that. I wonder if that has to do with human um, behavior, especially after two years of so much isolation and not being able to connect and trying to find that connection, which is not not authentic, really. It's this space that is formulated to give you an authentic experience, right? Therefore, it's not authentic. Uh, but I mean, I wonder if that's that, that response, that human response of the lack of connection, of being 
in the space with one, yeah, you know, of course. Phys- physically together. Yeah. But it's changed our business. Yeah. 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 Right now, like, how do you how do you navigate that for your clients now? Like, how do you come back to it and you say, it's ne- first of all, it will, it's not going to be the same. It doesn't matter whatever we do. Right? You're not going to go back to a restaurant. You're not going to have the same behaviors. You're not going to be the same. Nobody will. You just can't, it's, you, it's, it's, an, it's impossible. Yep. People are more connected now to, to this, and you're going to be your here. Phone. Yeah, to your you're phone. You're right here, and I'm still like this, right? Mm-hmm. Because now you've really done this, right? So I think it's changed the restaurant space. I mean, do you agree or, do you, or not agree? And if you don't agree, I don't care. <laughs> tell, tell me your opinion. <laughs> I want to know because I feel like people really need to hear it because yep. I don't think that they realize, like, traditional PR isn't the same. Traditional anything is gone. I, yep. I don't think anything, anything. Uh, I don't know. I, I don't know. Although I, I, don't, I don't know. Yeah, I really <laughs> hey, don't Mary, know. You know what? She doesn't know. That's why you're here. <laughs> I want. I want to talk. I want to talk more about that. Like, what do you? Yeah. So um, I don't do PR. I do more content marketing, which yeah. is geared more towards consumers directly. Mm-hmm. And yeah, since the pandemic, there's more people staying at home. They. St- more people getting carry out, more people getting like delivery instead. We've gotten so comfortable like sitting at home, you know, with our snuggies and our slankets. Um, but we my still... jeans feel it. You just <laughs> dropped the slanket. You just dropped the slanket, the original snuggie. I have so many pairs of jeggings at this point because like I cannot wear hard pants anymore. Nothing with a zipper, please. <laughs> Do you know your point of the different the different um she said slanket yeah, though. Yeah, that was the worst it's, marketing. They could have been the snuggie, they just needed to change the word, but they wouldn't change it. No, and the slanket slank died. Is horrifying. Yeah. Cause <laughs> but it was a better product. The slanket was a better product and the snuggie came cheaper with a cuter name. Well, there's Sorry. branding. The power of branding. Wait, I, I should have <laughs> Mary, I should have I should have changed it. I knew that you don't do PR anymore because and I also don't think that people are gonna do PR. I think they're gonna do marketing. Because that's what, what the shift is going to be. And I meant to say that I in think my question leading up. Being my all the years in advertising, I think the truth is it's been a slow progression between, it used to be, a, when I first started, way back when, there was such a divide between advertising and PR. There was no crossover, and it had a lot to do with the way the newspaper ran. And that if you there was no um, article written, pay to play, did not exist. Um, there was a definite line in the sand. And if you had a, like I worked in an agency that had a PR side and an agency side, there was never any mix to that because of that, that separation of church and state, in the, especially in the newspaper business. So it didn't look like they were getting articles that were fa- favorable to a company or to a brand because they were spending advertising dollars. Um, but I think as those things have changed, New pa- newspapers have had to shift, and the way we consume media or content has has obviously changed a great deal. Um, I think that that PR advertising space is such a bl- blur. And even way back then, there were you would want to do advertising, but you needed PR support. Like there were all these things, you're just using all of your efforts to break through, which is very very difficult. And when you were talking earlier about how people could behave inside restaurants. Just the other day, I was sitting at outside bar here, and I was one of five people there, and I was the only woman, five, six people sitting at this bar, maybe. Every single person was on a device, including me. I was working. I was on my laptop. Every other person was on their phone. And they could have been working as well. I mean, who knows? But they were not interacting, sitting at a bar, not speaking to each other at all. That's the way of the world today, right? Yeah. Yeah. It was just really interesting in how that human behavior, I mean, the bar is a place to be social, to be around people, and there they were, but around people, but literally in their own little bubbles. Especially as a woman, if you're at a bar alone, like, you kind of don't want to strike up a conversation with someone necessarily because most of the time you get hit on and you, you're probably not there for that purpose. Or, or maybe you are, I don't know, but... <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if you... If you if you were there on a Bumble date and then you didn't like the date, yeah, maybe. <laughs> I mean, I'm okay with that, too. I have lots of clients that come from Bumble dates, but. What are some of the bigger things that you see changing in the food and beverage industry since those are your clients and you have, like, your pulse on that, or your finger on the pulse of that? Well, since uh, the pandemic started, alcohol sales are up. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. And I love that 
DC law now has to go cocktails and drinks, I think that's a fantastic idea. Yeah. Indefinitely right now. Is it? Yeah, Virginia just... Took uh, it away? Mm -hmm. They haven't taken it away that didn't pass, though. So that it mm -hmm. has an expiration date over here. It would be interesting to see how long that lasts when dollars and cents come into play. It doesn't, doesn't for us. You're going to keep it because they're not sure. I'm surprised yeah. Virginia doesn't have that. I mean, it's a pandemic. We, yeah. We need something. Yeah, yeah. no yeah. kidding. <laughs> yeah. And they want our tax dollars, so I'm so surprised that they turned that. How do we how do we change the open open container law so that we can just like walk down the street with a cocktail? That's what I'm interested in. <laughs> I, I, mean, I guess I could love do it New anyway. Orleans. But yeah. you want to talk about New Orleans? All right, let's talk about New Orleans. I love New Orleans for that reason. Yeah. Everyone right. down there is just happy. Right. Yeah. So let's exactly. do that. Let's just I'm into it. I mean, there's a lot of vomit in the streets, but that's another issue. Yeah, that's yeah, it's beautiful. <laughs> I mean, in, all, in July, um, it's beautiful. No, wait, t wait, keep going. So alcohol sales are up. Alcohol you know that. sales are up. Um, creative ideas. Uh, for example, Rose's Luxury now has his roses at home. Mm -hmm. So I think it's kind of like um, packaged dinners on a subscription, a monthly subscription oh. base. Interesting. Where you can enjoy a Rose's Luxury experience at home. Yeah. Smart. And a lot of companies, are, I'm sorry, a lot of restaurants are doing the same thing, but I, it's very interesting how Rose's Luxury has branded it. They put a lot of thought into how they brand it as a, a monthly subscription service. And, you know, it, is it on the little pricier side? I mean, you know, Rose's is not, yeah. you know, cheap. it's not a cheap meal. Yeah. Um, and now you're saying you have to, you know, you can sign up for a monthly subscription. But I will give it to them. It's very smart on their end. Yeah, I want to, you know, I feel like it's, I give it to anybody that could come up with the space right now. Like, it's it's so hard. And, like, I, I watch so many people pour the, so much money into restaurants that have opened and closed during the pandemic. Like, literally open and shut all at the same time. And, like, I'm like, you were slated to open. And like, what are you going to do? And, you you know, you open. It's, like, all your life savings. But, you know, no one, there's no more foot traffic. You know, maybe you're at a downtown location. You know, maybe you're in uh, New York City and you're, like, you Ugh. know, uh, in the Bowery, you know, I don't know, you know, you're someplace where people don't live, right? You didn't, nobody could plan for this. Do you know what I mean? And like, I, I, survival of the fittest for sure, for sure. But um, creative space, we're at creative space, that's a very <laughs> cool idea. Give me something, what else are you working with? Well, I'm not working with this organization, but I thought this was very relevant for Women's Month. Um, the Women's Food Fest popped up during the pandemic, and it was all your favorite um Women restaurant owners like um, Ruth from Pizza Paradiso yeah. oh. and Diane from Cork and Doron from Sticky Fingers. Mm -hmm. There's got to be probably 50 women restaurant owners who got together and they started offering all these packages, which you can still get on their um, on their website. Uh, and they offer all sorts of like little meal packages. And the website is... They've actually, so let me let me backtrack. It used to be womensfestdc.com. It now is regardingherfooddc.org. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. A little long. Regardingherfooddc.org. Yeah. So um, Regarding Her is a nonprofit um, based out of L.A. And they are, they're, they're creating more chapters, D.C. being one of them, where it's the same premise. A lot of women-owned F&B industry, F&B businesses getting together and offering Food baskets, dinners, um, all yeah. sorts of yeah, food products, which you know yeah. you can purchase and support your favorite woman-owned business. Collaborate the well. Do you agree with this? I guess here's a good here's a good thing. So regarding her is amazing, by the way, and any woman entrepreneur in any field can join. Just you know, you don't have to be a food and beverage person. You could be like in um, the media space. You could be in. You know, whatever. whatever. So I, I would, we can put that link up, right? Yeah, so if we're regarding her, there, it's amazing what the, these women in LA put together. But collaborations from the pandemic, like you've seen so many collaborations. Like it's so kind of amazing that you've taken like two people to like help each other, like like take a bigger space, right? And I find that um, the Women's Food Fest uh, and now regarding her, which they, they changed the name, you know, they did that for everybody. You know, it gave a little bit of, like, um, light in a, in a very dark way. It was very dark for a while. Like, even the writing was dark. Um, like, with even the food, there was, like, no, 
you know, food critic writing. There was like a lot of at home recipes, things to do with like Bisquick. I don't fucking know. I read all kinds of bullshit. <laughs> so many sourdough starters. Fuck sourdough. Like I loved, I loved sourdough bread before the pandemic, and now I just fucking hate it. <laughs> I don't want to eat sourdough pizza. I don't fucking want to eat your sourdough. And, and don't give me any either, because I don't want it. Um, I do appreciate all the things that people did at home, right? I also, um, you know, I got to give it to a lot of these people that are home making fucking media content, and it's, you know, somebody, like, making, like, something in their house, right? This fucking perfect you know, bun, this perfect sourdough bun, and they make one fucking sandwich. And they're like, it's literally perfect because they made it for eight fucking hours, Mm -hmm. right? And they made it beautiful, and they painted the bun, they did all the things, and they made it unrealistic. And then they go and get your sandwich, your your hamburger from your restaurant, and then they compare it to their perfect bullshit. And you're like, make 1,000 of your perfect buns in one hour. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Then open a restaurant. (laughs) But don't fucking come to me with your Play-Doh bullshit, (laughs) fucking sourdough bun bread, and tell me, I I started this sourdough six months ago and kept it in my basement. And you should keep all your sourdough in the basement because it's amazing and put Legos in it. And you're like, yeah, okay. I'm like, what the fuck are you talking about? <laughs> Damn like, it! Now I got to take back the bre- the sourdough. No, but you know what I it is. You. you know what it is. Like, there's like, there is just so much to it. Yeah. Right. Like sourdough is uh, obviously a hot point for me, but <laughs> obviously. <laughs> but I think the collaboration that restaurant tours did with each other is amazing. I think some of the things that we did with some of the at home people were also pretty cool too. Yeah. You know, but like I do find that some of the people had nothing fucking better to do than to destroy restaurants. And think it was a good time to like bash them and be like, well, there's my perfect little burger and compare it to people that like legitimately have businesses where well, you really are, you know, just trash to me, really. <laughs> that was just rude. Some people did really mean things to restaurants. Yeah. And well, like people are miserable. But exactly. People are miserable, but people love to watch people get bashed mm-hmm. and they destroyed them. I gotta wonder people like that have never worked in the food and beverage business. Because yeah. You, you don't understand. Yep. And, yeah. and maybe it's a little arrogance, a little control issue. I don't know what it is, but I did notice that a lot of content creators were like writing reviews during the pandemic as like, you can't be serious. Like no. there are staff shortages and, and you know, food shortages, like yeah. food costs are going up. Like this is not the time to leave your review. Even Tom Seatsima stopped doing, you know, reviews. Yeah, during you that had time. to. There was nothing. What are you gonna do? Literally, the food shortages and 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 all that has not stopped. The trucking industry is definitely going to put a stop to all everything. I don't know. I don't know. I think that nobody understands that. But the first time that they really saw it in the grocery store was the best. One of my a girlfriend of mine called me. She's like, "There's no fucking cream cheese in the grocery store." I go, <laughs> "Would you fucking imagine that?" <laughs> I've been telling you for like weeks this is coming. <laughs> it's affecting my industry because we buy so much of it and is a and they're rationing it and the distributors did a great job here in DC to make it at least it's not as painful as what happened in Philadelphia and in New York. And it wasn't until it hit the Wegmans that everyone's like all of a sudden, do you know there's no cream cheese? Yeah, I know there's no cream cheese, but but the guys posting on the stores when they go into the grocery store and they're like, why is this store out of cream cheese? And look at all this cream cheese with their phone. That's a real first world problem. And you're, like, like, and, you're, and you're like, dude, that cream cheese been in that grocery store since fucking September. I can't have September. another dry bagel again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, no cream cheese, use butter. Yeah, that's like, our little butter. <laughs> no, but you know what I mean? Like, nobody realized how like grocery no, stores work. Like, like yeah. there's like so much food there for like months. Well, it's also and a, because it's- And a restaurant's like fresh every week. It's that first world problem. We don't, we fortunately, as Americans, haven't had, we, we don't live with those shortages. We haven't had to live with those shortages until now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I have a shortage. Yeah, me too. I have a deficit. Let's get a cocktail. I have an alcohol deficit. Let's go. Let's do it. <laughs> so you're going to, so this cocktail we're going to do is um, just a hot berry. And basically, um, so what's in here is uh, we have a half an ounce of uh, chartreuse. We're making two cocktails. Half an ounce of chartreuse. Um, one ounce of mezcal, one ounce of forged gin, and then we're gonna use about three ounces of uh, strawberry, uh, mashed strawberry or strawberry puree, whatever is uh, easier for you to get will totally work. Um, and the reason why we're using uh, strawberries, I, I kind of like, 
I don't know, I just love like mezcal and strawberry and all the flavors together. It's kind of like one of my favorites. Um, and then we're gonna put an ounce of uh, simple syrup. Uh, we're gonna use a pinch of salt. And you know, here's the thing, you can do whatever you want with this, but I always like to put like a, some kind of like, you know, an herb or something on there. And since we're not using bitters or anything, I'm just gonna use a couple of leaves of uh, mint and just throw it in. So we're not gonna muddle it, we're just gonna throw that in with our mix. Um, and then top it off with our shaker of ice. And we're just gonna shake it and like, so easy, just delicious. Hard to have a nice face. <laughs> when you have the two drinks in the shaker, it's tough. All right, so we're gonna do this drink up. It's just a nice, like, you know, a little refresher. Just, you know, something to remind you that, like, you know, it's, it's okay. Think pink, you know, Women's Month. <laughs> I think you mean drink pink. We can drink pink. Oh, good Oh, night. good one. Mary's definitely our kind of gal. I know, seriously. <laughs> Thank you very much. But I also, I don't know if you've had a lot of cocktails that are mixed with uh, gin and mezcal. It's quite lovely. It's one of my favorite things to do. Very unsurprising, oh no, very, not unsurprising, very surprising combination that works together. All right. It's nice and thick. Yum. That's what he said. I know, I know. <laughs> ba -da -ba. <laughs> I'm just gonna do just a little, little mint across the top because Lovely. we can. Lovely. And some pretty cocktail glasses. May I? May I? Yes, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Cheers. Cheers. I think I'm gonna, let's just call it drink pink. Drink there you pink. Go. Let's drink pink. So exciting. All right, so now have the nut and the drink. It's gonna be so stupid. You're gonna be like, what? Yeah, crunch your nut, crunch your nut. And I don't know why the strawberry and this nut and the mezcal and the salt, I don't know, it just all kind of works. Oh, definitely. Right? And Do it you, changes. Oh, excuse me. Spit nut at you now. Um, so just so you know, <laughs> at, at home, I, I have like, these little um, coated uh, peanuts and they're like a little bit spicy and I feel like that's like red dye number five on them, but they're yeah. not. <laughs> but uh, maybe they are, I don't know, but I just love these nuts, I don't care. Kind of um, remind me of the Boston baked beans of, from that used to come in the little box that you could get at the five and dime, as we would call so it. So I would, I don't know that, but I do know that, I swear to God, I think these nuts used to be in bar, um, put a quarter in oh, and get them, yeah. like in a bar. Oh, Those gumball yeah. machines. It, it, would, it, it would come out in the little, yeah. uh, the little spigot yeah. thing. Yeah, yeah. Those are really uh, and as Mary, you know, kindly, you know, she gave us a good name for it. You know, we'll, we'll change the name of the drink because I didn't think, you know, drink pink. It's yeah. pretty good. Yeah. yeah, there you go. I love that. There you go. I love that. And this is a very easy recipe. So again, you'll get the recipe at designateddrinker.show and I'll give you all the updates to it. And then of course, um, maybe even a link to where I buy my salt. Okay. Because I feel like if you don't, um, salt, I use the Cypress saltiness and like, I feel like it's a hard thing to find at the grocery store and you might need to like go uh, online and get that. I get it from the place in Seattle and the name is Literally escaping me, and that's okay. We'll have it in the episode I notes. Know. People can just scroll down and find store. it. What is the name of his store, Mark Bitterman? But I think it's a really good. Um, it's a really good point. Is bit. Um, I have to admit. I mean, I hang out with people like you all the time, and I stand there and look at salt. I mean, I hear you say it. I know, like spending this much time with you, making cocktails, watching you make cocktails. The I know. There she goes. She was thinking the whole time. She wasn't even listening. I know she wasn't. I was. I was like, yeah, let's do two but, things at once. But <laughs> I had to like roll it exit. It's called the meadow. <laughs> but I, I think I, when even when even all the knowledge I've got gained from Gina, I still stand there and look at salt sometime, going, ah. and it's often, what would Gina do? I mean, there. That's that would. That's a. I think. What's that's your favorite thing. salt? Do you have a favorite salt? Italian. Was it Moldovian salt? Mm, yeah, it's really good. Yeah. yeah. Big big flakes. Yeah, that's tasty. Um, yeah, now I think you can get it in like in store in the grocery stores now people are billing it as Sicilian salts because like apparently people are off put by names that they can't like say. I was like, um, I don't know that many people that can say Sicilian correctly, but okay, let's do it. Yeah, I think I said Moldovia. That Moldovia is a different country. It, it's, no, I know what you're talking about. The Moldon salts. I know what you're Moldon, talking about. Yeah, yeah. Moldon Moldon. salts. Okay. Yeah, okay. you're talking about the right thing, but now people are calling it Sicilian salts and like I don't know like why and that's fine. Just eat the salt. It's great. <laughs> and what's nice about like the better salts is that you don't put so much on there. Like you yeah. put like one, two flakes, and you really 
control the sodium, but you also crunch it like you're supposed to eat salt. Mm-hmm. Anyway, anyway, yeah, that's yeah. a whole other. When we come back, we'll do a whole other. We'll do a, we'll salt do a tasting. salt tasting. We'll we'll be so bloated. <laughs> Ankles will be swollen, but boy, we'll have a good day. Then we'll have next uh, next person up will be a gout doctor. It's no problem. <laughs> Tell me, so what's next? What's next for you? What's going on? What's where, what are we gonna find you doing now? What's up? Yeah, what is it? Girls Meets Foods Not Dead, still going. Yeah, so for the people who don't know, I started a one of DC's first food blogs called Girl Meets Food back in 2009. It was a long time ago. Um, yeah, we're it's not currently active anymore because I don't have the proper time to devote to it. Um, the Instagram, you just posted something on there recently. Yeah, but so blogs, I saw, there's you know, so much to, work. There's so much work, just so like podcasts. Much. Yes, yes. Um, no, every once in a while, I, I post a food pic just to support my favorite restaurants. Yeah. Um, uh, speaking of Women's Month, I just did a Kamayan dinner at Purple Patch in Mount Pleasant. In Washington, D.C. She's is amazing. Chef Patrice Cleary is amazing. And um, she had stopped doing the Kamayan dinners during the pandemic. Uh, you know, things change. But um, because I know her personally, she said she was willing to do it. And she laid out this perfectly executed Kamayan dinner for 12 of us. And there was lechon pork belly mm. and fried eggplant and lumpia and uh, fried whole red snapper, and it was Yum. just laid out on a table, probably six feet long, lined with banana leaves, and it was perfect. It was a communal dinner, and um, everything was wonderful. There was a karaoke machine, so <laughs> that's even better. <laughs> Goes perfect with lumpia. <laughs> yeah, so you sing a little bit, you come back to the table, you take a handful of rice and fish yes. and whatever, some shrimp, and you go back to singing, you know, don't Stop Believing by Journey. <laughs> uh, yes. Oh, no. Perfect. It's going to be my head. All day, that earworm. <laughs> yes. Mary, I thought I liked you. <laughs> and uh, I think she was so inspired because it was so loved. Everybody had such a great time. Hopefully, they'll inspire her to do more that's during great. the pandemic because that's the sort of thing that brings people together. Yep. And uh, that's not the sort of thing you can really replicate at home properly. Yeah. So you really have to come out to the restaurant and do it and invite 10 of your favorite friends to do and just eat together because that's what food and drink is all about, bringing people together and having a good time. Yeah, absolutely. Um, are you still taking new clients? I am taking new clients. So um, you put a link up for that. Please do. Do you have a restaurant in need or food service or anything in that space, right? Yeah. Yeah. So yes. we do. We focus a lot on social media, um, email marketing. Um, what else? Uh, content marketing is what yeah. we call it these days. And um, it's, it's interesting because I see a lot of you know, the next generation bloggers or influencers, as they're called now. Yes. And they're called content creators now. Uh, restaurants are hiring them, maybe in lieu of PR, because sometimes all you need is someone to like take care of your social media feed and get the word out there directly to customers. Yep. I think depending on the business, there's there might be an equal need for both, but maybe not. I mean, I think each restaurant, each business, not just restaurant, but business, um, has different needs and Sometimes PR isn't it. Mm-hmm. Maybe it's too far, too disconnected. Winning that, going back to get, having that um, forced authentic experience. Uh, I think you have to evaluate those things because not doing it is basically shutting off the oxygen and the lifeblood of those businesses. Yeah, I think PR is very important. Um, you know, you want those relationships with the press. But if you're a small starting yep. business, sometimes you can't afford PR. Exactly. Um, and so content marketing is, is very important too. At least it's something to get your message out there. And I found it in, I founded Fatback Media uh, seven years ago. And now I focus on women-owned businesses. That's um, great. Yeah, I enjoy working with small businesses. Yep. I think it's more intimate, it's more personal, and I, I enjoy that. And it's fun. Yeah. There is a certain amount of fun to uh, the entrepreneurial spirit before you become corporate. Do you know what I mean? And like, mm. And unfortunately... I don't care how mom and pop you are, when you begin, you know, once you hit that threshold and you have, like, all of a sudden 100 employees, you're not so mom and pop anymore because you have to pay all their insurance and you have to make sure that everyone gets a paycheck every two weeks, whether there's a pandemic or not. And, you know, you have a lot of people to take care of, so you can't just be loosey-goosey, which I totally loved about the beginning of my business. It was the best. 
I don't think anyone can accuse you of being loosey goosey. In oh the my beginning, God. it was this, fun. This I was the woman much... who laid sod down at like two in the morning or something for the opening of Suburbia. That was my best. Um, yeah. And then I found out I was pregnant. That was my favorite. So part. wait a minute, you laid sod and got pregnant? Oh no no no! Apparently, I was a month pregnant. <laughs> I was, did I was, lay that sod. I laid the sod. Is that Neil's nickname? Yeah, sod. sod. <laughs> We lay, we'll call him General Side. And I kept saying, I kept saying to everybody, I'm like, I don't feel good. And everyone's like, shut up. You don't, you're not getting out of this work. I'm like, all right. And there we are pounding down, because apparently you have to pound down Saad. Oh, look at oh. you, pounding down Saad anyway. and you got pregnant. <laughs> but that's what I mean. Like, that's exactly what I mean. When you're a corporate, you don't just go and build an Airstream in the back of Union Market in yeah. an alley. At night with your bartender friends after you've just bartended all night yep. and you start working on it at 3 o'clock in the morning till 8 o'clock the next morning and then sleep for four hours and then go back to work. You know but that's I mean? also because you were younger and you didn't have kids yet. Well, you had one in bacon. You just didn't I know. know. <laughs> Neil and I didn't even know I was pregnant. It was like so funny. when I, I was crazy. Anyway. All right. Here we go. So you last, have the last question. And we know that we've asked you before, but in this day and age, everybody identifies with either spirit, animal, or, you know, a mythical creature or something, and you might identify yourself with, um, I was going to say Grimace, because <laughs> Grimace is, you know, he's just a happy milkshake guy. Um, but if you can identify yourself with um, a, a beard ingredient, what ingredient would it be for cocktails or food, or what would your ingredient be? Like something that defines you. I would probably have to say that my spirit animal is Popeye's chicken. Yes. Spirit, spirit ingredient. Yeah. Well, I'm sure yeah. you can turn that ingredient into a cocktail. Yeah. <laughs> it is an animal because it once was. It once and was. And now it's an ingredient. Which Popeye's chicken, though? It's very Popeye's specific. Original chicken. recipe, Asian spice. What is it? Which one? Spicy dark all the way. And I have a story behind that. Oh, she's I like me. She went likes it spicy to the dark. Popeye's mar, mar, mar. chicken on 14th Street a few years ago on National Fried Chicken Day. Mm. And if you are familiar with the 14th Street location, sometimes there are panhandlers outside. Yes. Well, so, this one, this particular location, there was a man inside, and he was like standing right next to the cash register, which is very smart, I think. Because <laughs> um, you can't say I don't have any money. <laughs> yeah. And he would ask people, like, do you mind buying me something to eat? And so when it was my turn to go up to the register, he asked me, do you mind buying me something to eat? I said, sure, it's fried chicken day, what would you like? And he says, this bitch, he says, I want a chicken breast mild. I was like, this is Popeye's fried chicken. Nobody asked for mild white meat. Like, <laughs> there's no flavor in that. Like, where do you even yeah. think you are? I ordered it for him because I'm a nice person. But I almost snatched the bag away from him because I can't believe he ordered mild white meat. Yeah, yeah, no, 100%. It's like eating fried styrofoam. <laughs> yes, there's no flavor. There's no flavor. Yes, there's no Those flavor. Those Cajun spices cannot even help that. Yes, I agree with that. So. I love that you're a Popeye's fan. 100%, I think we need to do another, uh, we need something else with Mary for sure after this. Let's do yeah. it. All right, well, cheers. All right, let's go get another cheers. cocktail. Cheers, cheers, another cocktail. Cheers, cheers. Cheers. Thanks for coming. Thanks for having me. The Designated Drinker Show is produced by Missing Link, a podcast media company that is dedicated to connecting people to intelligent, engaging, and informative content. Also in the Missing Link lineup of podcasts is Roger That, a podcast dedicated to guiding you through the haze of dementia, led by skilled caregivers Bobby and Mike Carducci. Now, if you're looking for a whole new way to enjoy the theater, check out Between Acts, an immersive audio theater podcast experience. Each episode takes you on a spellbinding journey through the works of newfound playwrights, from dramas to comedies and everything in between. Find Missing Link's League of Podcasts on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you find your podcasts. Please don't forget to subscribe, download, and review the shows. Your review helps our shows reach new audiences. To find out more about Missing Link, visit missinglink.company. That's missinglink.company. <laughs>